hello, my name is Tom. Some of you might know me as Hipsterpuck. Uh, I'm a musician from the Netherlands and I make neoclassical music, ambient music, and uh, also experimental music right now. Okay, I'm glad you decided to lead with the genres because the first thing I want to do is try to pick apart like how music falls into these genres. Neoclassical is relatively new. And so tell me those three genres, kind of what those three genres mean to you and how you see your music kind of fitting in them. All right, um, let's start with neoclassical because <laughs> okay. I think that's the main thing that that uh, has uh, has my interest uh, for music. Um, for me, neoclassical is the more uh, real classical side of music. Uh, think about like um, where you had uh, Mozart and uh, Bach and uh, the other musicians back in the 1900s, 1800s of uh, of uh, uh, music. We have now a whole new group of people who also make classical music. Uh, for example, um, let's say uh, Max Richter is a very uh, famous musician who makes uh, neoclassical music. Uh, Olaf Arnold uh, is a, a very important uh, uh, person in the in the scene of neoclassical music. Um, and for me, it's also is. Uh, the people that make film music, um, they they uh, all make music for films. I'm thinking about uh, other artists to uh, name because there's a lot of uh, neoclassical artists. Um, but then let's go to the next genre, what is ambient. Uh, Wait, and can I ask, uh, yeah, actually, yeah, <laughs> I find neoclassical so interesting, and I've only discovered it in the past couple of years, although I realize I've been listening to it probably my whole life because you did mention film music so it's stuff that's accessible it's music we can understand and appreciate easily many times when we hear it it's either calm or energizing we we just understand the chords that are being used we understand the instruments that are showing up we can follow we can follow along Whereas, so this neoclassical, um, it's an interesting name because when I think of classical, I think of a classical that was very accessible. You mentioned a yeah. couple people. Anybody can listen to Beethoven or Mozart or Bach or Tchaikovsky and enjoy it. Then music became more modern and postmodern, and it became more dissonant, and it they didn't want to use the old modes of music making, and so it just became harder to listen to. Um, how, do, how does neoclassical, the classical music today... The current mm -hmm. composers, when I listen to them, the stuff is sometimes difficult. It's more modern, and it's not yeah. stuff you'd sit down and listen to for background music. You'd have to sit down and really appreciate it. Um, how does neoclassical and more modern classical compare in your mind? Uh, this is a really good question. Um, like you said, uh, neoclassical is, uh, is music that you uh, need to sit down for to listen to it. Uh, a great example for this is, um, let me think, I think about uh, Infra, that's an album from Max Richter. And it's not an uh, album you just listen one song and be like, okay, yeah, I enjoy it and uh, I'm done with it, you know. It's, uh, I think, uh, 10 songs or something. And when you listen it, listen to the whole full album, you get the whole story of that album. It, I think... Um, I might be wrong here, but I think it's about the bombing in London in 2004 or five, and he made uh, a whole soundtrack surrounded uh, for that uh, for that event that happened then, or for the attack that happened then, and uh, it leads to to the point of the explosion and um, the aftermath of it. it. It's really weird to explain it like this, but. Um, um, it's it's something you need to hear like like this whole album i really recommend uh other people that listening to this podcast to sit down listen to that album and um yeah experience it because it's it's a wonderful album but the story is uh is really sad behind this album but it is interesting it is listenable so like max richter also did this long like almost an eight hour piece called uh, sleep. sleep yes <laughs> and i I love that work beyond, I love it so much. The repetitive, 
it's got rep- the repetitive themes, the calmness of it, the things disappear for a while and then come back. There's some yeah. noise, but it's never like a- abrasive. So I, to me, it's very accessible. But I see what you're saying. To many people, maybe they're not used to that kind of lengthy work. But I, I neoclassical to me is very listenable. And, and as you said, with film music, we all understand film music. And in your case, he said, you know, he was thinking of an event and writing to that event for that work. Yeah, We're kind of used to people putting music to events. And so I think it's very listenable. But you're right that it's not like it's not like a pop song, but it's no. way more listenable than super modern classical music sometimes, which True. is deliberately difficult. Yes. I Again, the word abrasive, Some of, it's just so <laughs> abrasive. The, the thing is, like, I, I tried to listen to Vivaldi, The Four Seasons, and uh, at some point I was like, you know what, I, I absolutely love this, and it's it's wonderful, but I, I, I cannot just listen to this. And then, um, <laughs> let's go back to Max Richter once, uh, yeah. once again, because he made... Um, uh, what's it called? Vivaldi recompelled or something like, or recomprised something like or that. something like that. And it's also the Four Seasons, but it's wonderful. It's it's electronic mixed with classical, and it's very very easy easy to listen to. Um, and again, it's an experience you really need to hear because, like, uh, it's it's just wonderful how how much power the, that music has and uh, how much energy it gives and. Um, it's it's music from a higher level or something. I don't know, but it's it's, it's very special. Okay, so I interrupted you. We we're going to move on to ambient, and I've been listening to ambient since like the '80s, and I okay. feel like it started out again with some difficult stuff that was really built on machine noises and early keyboard and computer sounds that were mixing noise and music together. And so sometimes it's easy to listen to. And other times it's a little challenging to sit down. Again, it's dissonant and abrasive. So what is your understanding of ambient? How does your music fit in there? Uh, ambient is for me more the, uh, uh, let's say, the soundscape music. Like it's uh, long pads, long long sounds. It, it takes a while before it gets to another point. It just comes back and then it stays a little bit longer. Sometimes you put some instruments uh, in between parts. Like uh, you can put the piano there for two minutes and people will enjoy it, but you need to build it up with other things like a guitar or um, like drone sounds, like you said, with computer sounds, like you can make it very weird, but it's also like uh, with neoclassical music, it's also very, um, uh, how shall I explain this? Like light to listen to, it's not heavy or anything. It, It could be heavy, but it's definitely more like uh like i said before like soundscape so it it takes a while but it's very enjoyable to listen to okay what was the third one so neoclassical ambient where else could your music fit in uh <laughs> experimental that's an interesting experimental one. <laughs> that could be anything yeah. <laughs> it's the easiest genre everything is experimental now um no <laughs> um I'm 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 not very experimental with my music, but I'm working on a EP right now um, for for projects, and that's going to be more experimental. Um, and what that means for me is that you can put um, how should I say this? Like it's more effects, it's more weird. You can make weird sounds. You can make uh, also like sound uh, sound uh, scapes, but then absolutely weird with sounds and effects and voices and vocals and stuff like that and um i really enjoy that too to create sometimes not not for a full album or anything or like for uh, multiple projects but sometimes i just enjoy making a song like that or an ep like that okay i do want to ask um so uh, neoclassical to ambient to experimental i feel like we go from the most accessible and easy to listen to, the most familiar, all the way to music that's deliberately a little less familiar. Yes. Um, so I listened to some of your tracks, and mm-hmm. maybe I don't. I don't know if we'll include uh, certainly links to them, but maybe we'll drop them in somehow. But okay. In in some of it, let's talk. I wanted. To, I listened to the Journey of Dreams, mm-hmm. and I was I was interested because one of the things I love about Johan Johansson and Max Richter is their use in some of their works of dissonant noises 
and dissonant notes. So notes aren't sitting together happily in chords. There's mm -hmm. like they're in conflict as you listen to them. But it's just enough dissonance. So I wanted to ask you, like with this, I think there was dissonance in this track. So things, but then it wouldn't stay for long or it, it didn't. How do you balance if you're trying to make something a nice melody mm -hmm. and you want to put in something that doesn't quite fit that melody, but it's a kind of a lower volume? How do you balance between unsettling people with the music and having them just sit in the melody they already know? So how do you keep how do you keep your dissonance and experimentalism from being making the song difficult to listen to? Uh, that, that's an really interesting question. Um, no, the, the way I, I work with music or make music is... Um, there's always a main instrument that, that I find important for that song, and that's going to be the bass for it. After that, I'm going to put together uh, put uh, some more instruments together, see what works, see what fits, see if it works together. And sometimes it doesn't work together, but that's the magic of music that uh, that a song can uh, not work but sound perfect. So, <laughs> and. Um, yeah, um, that, that's that's it for uh, Journey of Dreams was for me um, to make it ambient, but also with a lot of sounds and a lot of um, dreamlike experience. And uh, the whole EP uh, that, that it is on is called uh, Nouveau Chapitre, what is French for new chapter. And that was the story for this whole EP. Like I start a new chapter with my music and uh, a part of it is new sounds, new effects and new things to try and i think that's uh what i tried with this song also do you ever put a lot of stuff into a track and then you think it's done and when you go back and re-listen to it or ask someone else to listen to it and do you ever think there's too much in here i need to pull something down or pull something out uh yeah that happens sometimes <laughs> uh you can never have enough sound but <laughs> <No>. <laughs> No, but um, they, no, there there are moments that that I think like, okay, you know what? This is a little bit too much, and this is a little bit too too overpowering for for the sound that I want to have. With like, if I want to focus on the piano and I put a drum and a and a trumpet and and a violin there, it, it doesn't work together at at some points. And um, that that is the moment that I uh, look back to the song, change things, and see what fits, or that I need to change the whole song or the whole part of that song to see if it works. Um, let me, again, some of the, um, so Max Richter's Sleep is an example, or again, um, Johan Johansson's first album, I have now listened to it. In the last year I discovered it, I've listened to it like a hundred times. It's fantastic. It, it is, it's, it's yeah. just, but here's the part, I don't fully understand why I like it so much. And one part, one reason I don't fully understand why I like it so much is, the power of long notes, so long held notes, melodies that are composed of only three to four notes, mm -hmm. and then repetition. So that Johansson's first album is just jammed with repetition. It's the same melodies and the same themes over and over and over again, over dozens of tracks. True. And they shift. But I'm like, why am I not bored of this? I keep hearing these horns playing the same notes, but it's not quite boring. It feels slightly different. And that's the impression I got from the Journey of Dreams. Again, there are repetitive things that happen constantly in it. Where's the balance between I'm bored of hearing this these notes over and over again, or I'm bored of hearing this one droning note? How do you balance between boredom and I'm not sure what the feeling is or something resonating about hearing something just keep going on and on and on? Yeah, you know, uh, I really recognize this because sometimes <laughs> I, I'm listening to a song and I'd be like, oh, it's it's the same thing again. But I don't mind that. I, I absolutely love that, that it, it's coming back and that I can enjoy it again and again and again. Um, so um, asking the balance is, is kind of hard because um, for me, I'm, I'm most of the time afraid that it's going to be uh, too, too much of the same with, with my music, like the whole album that I'm creating. Um, I'm, I'm most of the time afraid like, oh, people are not going to like this because it's sound the same or it's a bit the same as the other songs or it's not really working together as, as an album or a song and um i think the balance is um it, it's going to sound stupid but 
uh, not making your songs too long and uh, make it interesting for people, even if it sounds uh, um, uh, like the same sound over and over again. Uh, but add some things to it, like even if it's a little thing like a bell or a little choir that you hear in the background or uh, I don't know, a guitar or a violin and it's only need to be a whoosh or a woo or something like that. <laughs> and and people will be like, oh, but maybe there's more, maybe maybe there's more going to be the, to this sound than only like the piano or the guitar that I'm hearing right now. So you need to... Um, surprise people with it like even like i said even it's uh, if it is with a little effect or a little sound or a little new instrument that you add to this song i think the element of surprise is very important with with neoclassical music and with ambient music um i'm curious so you uh you mentioned the length of a song like something can't go on too long sometimes things feel too short and a lot of these neoclassical things, I could see how somebody would come to them and say, the word I would use to describe some of them as self-indulgent. This is mm -hmm. indulgent. Oh, did this thing need to be 19 minutes? You could have <laughs> got this whole thing done in three minutes. I 100% say that track, that work needed to be 19 minutes because there's some experience you have in the repetition of something for 19 minutes mm. versus Verse, chorus, verse, bridge, yeah, chorus, it's, out. It's sometimes boring too. I mean, I, I've been listening to a lot of indie music the uh, last couple of weeks. And even though I absolutely love that music too, um, I sometimes just go back to a Oliver Arnold song or like uh, Johan Johansson or something like that and listen to it for 10 minutes, one song, and be like, yeah, I love this more than the, the modern pop and the modern indie. And I can enjoy that music too. And I can enjoy some... Uh, Phoebe Bridgers or or some uh, Bonnie Fair or stuff like that, but at some point I'd be like, oh, you know what? I'm going back to neoclassical for a while now. Going to enjoy that and just uh, experience that music. Um, thinking of a class, so a classical pop song with its clearly defined parts. It's mm -hmm. got again verse, chorus, ver verse, chorus, verse, bridge, whatever it is. Um. I notice with neoclassical works, and I notice with some of your works are shorter, so we're often we're not talking about 25, 30 minute songs. No. We're talking about sort of song length, song length pieces mm -hmm. that would fit in in a normal mixtape. Somebody's making a mixtape of five minute songs, some of these songs would fit right on the five minute song. Yeah. But they don't have the parts the way a verse, chorus, verse. When you're constructing these things, how many parts do you decide to put in a single instrumental song? And how do you, I don't know, how do you, how do you think about the themes? How do you think about the construction of one of these is what I'm asking. Um, <laughs> also a really good question. Um, the thing is like, I, I cannot read notes or anything. I'm, I'm just start playing music and just see what happens. And sometimes I uh, put some chords together and see if it works. And uh, like I said before, like put some instruments together, see if it works, if it, doesn't work well too bad i'm going to change it and going to see what's uh what's possible with the song um there's not really a construction the most important thing is like i have a story that i want to tell in the song and i have an id and i visualize that id and then i put it to music it's it's a weird way of making music maybe but um i'm, I'm not really the first chorus first chorus kind of guy i'm i'm just want to make music and give you an experience when you listen to the album or uh, to the music and and i absolutely love to tell my own stories but i also love to hear uh people their stories what they have when they listen to my music or to uh classical music that's interesting do you feel like with instrumental works you are telling a story in your head you're telling a story that has a beginning a middle and an end mm -hmm. even though if people listen to that instrumental work they might not get it like i remember listening to i think it's uh d what, there's a danube there's this famous work that's named after a river it's either the moldau or the danube okay and it sounds a little like a river it starts out in trickles and gets loud and powerful and then becomes trickles again you can really visualize a river do you expect people to visualize particular things when they listen to your music? Do you care about that? And do you visualize very particular things when you're making it? Uh, yes, yes. Um, there, there, there's definitely a story that I want to tell in the album or in the EP or 
uh, when I make music. Like there's never a moment that I think like, oh, you know what? Ping pong ping, here's some music, enjoy it. And uh, here's an album. It, there's <laughs> always, there's always like a story that I want to tell. And um, some people might get that. Some people might have their own little story with it or their own feelings with it or their own like uh, emo- emotions with it. And uh, I'm, I'm really okay with that. But the most important thing is that you feel something with music. Like if I listen to music, um, I absolutely love it if I feel something with it or I, I it, it gets you emotional or it gives you a, a happiness or joy or anything like that. I think that's the most important thing of music. And that's what I really miss in uh, modern music. Like it's all the same, all the same uh, structure, all the same sounds. And there's not really feeling to it or there's not really like, um, how can you explain it? Like there's not really... St- I, I can enjoy it, but that's it. I've heard the song, I enjoyed it, and that's it. Like, as in, does the thing... Bo- I feel like there's two... In in p- most pop music, and maybe this has been around a really long time, there's mm-hmm. like these two feelings. One is, we're having fun and dancing, and this is happy. Yeah. Or, I'm sad something bad happened. Yes. So I'm sad <laughs> or happy, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, that, that's, that's more than pop music, in a nutshell. <laughs> But do you feel like there's a change? Now, I do. I Exactly as you're describing this, I'm thinking about why do I like this instrumental stuff? Why do I put it on when I need a different kind of emotional experience? Maybe it is that it feels like a, a bigger menu of feelings you can have, like that kind of not just sadness someone broke up with you, yeah. but like the melancholy that comes with being sad, but also enjoying the sadness. Maybe. The, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, there's no, more no, I, 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 I understand what you uh, what you try to explain, because that's that's the kind of feeling that I have with music, too. Like it can make me extremely happy at some point, especially if it is a little bit more uplifting uh, uh, music or neoclassical music in this case. Uh, but also, it's sometimes very, very sad and almost uh, depressive. Like, <laughs> and it's not that I'm depressive myself, but it's more like I I can enjoy this fe- or um, it's going to sound weird too. But I can enjoy this feeling, uh, and I can understand what you mean with this feeling or with the sound. So yeah, it's it's an interesting way of making music. How did you get started making music, and how did you find your way to making electronic music? Uh, I started back in 2018, um, and I started just uh, with uh, with samples in the, and putting samples together and see what what works and what doesn't work. And at some point, I think this was in 2019 or 2020, I decided like you know what I- I'm done with using samples. It it was fun, but I really want to make my own music. And that was also the moment that I was more listening to the neoclassical ambient uh, kind of music. Um, And then I decided like, you know what, I'm going to make an album and I'm going to play all the music myself. Um, And that album was Neo Noir. And at that point, um, I really didn't feel happy or anything like that. And I thought like, you know what, I'm going to try to put my feelings and my story from the last couple of years into that album and see how people react to it. And uh, since that moment, I've been more focusing on uh, storytelling in music than uh, just making sounds or uh, making songs. And um, I really want to focus on the story when I make an album or an EP, because I think that's, um, that makes it unique, but also I find it really important to tell a story when I uh, release something. Can I ask if if in an if in a world where people were still buying CDs mm-hmm. um, or where your thing was in an LP and you flip the back, you have a bunch of chance to tell everybody the story. You want to tell stories, but do you literally want to tell people this is the story that's in my head with this track and this is the story that was in my head for this album? Or do you mean I want to tell a story, but once I hand it over, I don't want to tell people what the story is necessarily? Ah. Uh. <laughs> It's a bit of both, actually. I mean, there, there, there are some songs that I'd be like, you know, it's, it's clear, you know, you, you get the idea behind this, behind this song. But there's also uh, some songs that, that I would uh, love to explain more about or to tell more about, like what the story was when I made it and uh, how it changed me or how it uh, changed uh, me later on in, in, in my music or in my uh, uh, music writing and stuff like that. Um, 
But sometimes it's also, like I said, uh, it's not important to tell my story, but have your own story with it. Uh, I find that also really uh, impressive or important um, if people uh, can create their own story with the music and have their own feeling. And like I said before, like their own emotional things and emotions with it, with it sound or with it uh, album. Wait, so how, so how old are you now and how old were you when you started just started you first started experimenting with those samples um i'm 30 right now and i've started five okay. years ago so 25 <laughs> okay so before that so for instance i love your i love your music and mm -hmm. neoclassical in general and electronic music because of music i listened to when i was a little kid yeah. so i've been listening to music my whole life what kind of music did you listen to when you were a little kid and uh, is it as influential on the music you make now? Have you been listening to music all the time or all of a sudden you kind of had an awakening a few years ago and started making it? Uh, no, I my interest was always with music, but more uh, listening music. And it, it went all over the place. I, I had um, uh, different phases in my life where I was listening to different music. So there was a gothic moment, there was a hip hop moment, there was an indie moment and... Uh, nowadays, it's more like I said, the neoclassical and uh, also still indie because it's super interesting sometimes to listen to some new indie bands. Um, so yeah, music has always played a part in my life. Do you wish people would sit down with headphones on or or air 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 mm -hmm. AirPods or earbuds? in a chair and close their eyes and listen to your music? Or do you like music that's just background? Like you turn it on and I do something else? Uh, the most ideal way would be to <laughs> for people to sit down and listen to it, I think. But I understand the people listening to this music um, in the background because it's also very good background music. And um, I also do that sometimes. Sometimes I really sit down and be uh, listening to an hour for, of an album. And sometimes it's just like, okay, you know what? I'm going to enjoy this music, but more in the background. I'm not really interested in fully focusing on this uh, song right now or this album right now. I just want to enjoy it. Do you find there's certain music? So in the neoclassical world, in the music, a lot of the music you listen to now, is there music you can only listen to in you like it, but you can only listen to it in the background because it's kind of boring and there's other music that kind of demands your whole attention? Is it a spectrum? Um, I think that I can listen to like news from before, uh, uh, for example, or um, uh, Oliver Arnold's, who I said before. I think those uh, songs I can listen to in the background and enjoy them. But there's uh, a Dutch piece uh, called Canto Ossinato. I'm not sure if you ever heard of it. It's like a three hour piece of uh, uh, piano music. It's very, very, uh, um, how do you call it? Repetitive. Repetri <laughs> the, <laughs> the same? No, you're just repetitive. <laughs> yeah, Wait, yeah. You have to tell me what is the name of it? Canto Ossinato. Okay. It's from Simeon ten Holt. Okay. And there, there are different uh, versions of it. Like uh, there's a three hour part, there's a one hour uh, or a three hour version, a uh, one hour version. Uh, there's versions with um, xylophones, trumpets, uh, the piano. The pianos are the most beautiful versions. Uh, they are played on three or four pianos most of the time. And it's really interesting, but you really need to sit down and um, listen to it and enjoy it. And sometimes you can uh, just dream away with this music because like uh, three hours sounds like a lot, but sometimes it just flies by with this with this uh, piece. It's it's really important, uh, really impressive. That has been my, I have li literally in bad moments, I have lied down, I've lain down on my bed, put my headphones on and again, listen to uh, Johansson's, f that first album. And it's broken up into pieces like one, 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 two, one, three, one, four. It's got like four major movements and yeah. they're not named and it's just numbered. And I, it it is it sends your brain into some state of imagination or it's very strange. I don't. So it yeah, sounds like this it, is it. It is weird, <laughs> but in a really good way. 
what is the so what are your dreams for the music career and what is the money like i mean when you put something on spotify or you put it on the streaming platforms what kind of money do you get back <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh not a lot <laughs> okay <laughs> uh, no no you know uh when i started making music i knew like it, it takes a lot of time to to uh, make money with it and i sometimes uh, sell an album on bandcamp or uh, i'm a part of uh, a label right now that's also very helpful uh, that is focusing on uh, neoclassical and ambient music. So that's very, very interesting to be a part of. Um, and then you get also more people that are interested in the music and buying your music. So in that case, uh, people uh, buy my music, but it's not making me rich. And uh, I never uh, had the intention of becoming rich and, uh, <laughs> and stuff like that. I, I just enjoy making music and uh, hope people can enjoy it. Uh, that's the most important thing for me. Uh, what was the other question I forgot? <laughs> oh no, no, I think you answered the question, but I had ah, a follow-up oh, okay. question. I'm curious. <laughs> okay, so that's kind of the that's kind of the money. You're like, maybe in your dream you would do it full time, or or do you actually like? I don't think I'd want to do this 12 hours a day. Uh, make music. Yeah. Oh no, I I can do it 24 hours if I have to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't mind. I mean, uh, put me behind the keyboard and I'm going to make music for you. But um, no, no, I, I I really enjoy it. And that's the most important thing. I always have said, like, if there's going to be a moment that I'm not enjoying it anymore or I feel like it's it's a chore to to make an album or uh, I really feel like I've, I've done everything that I could, I just stop and it's done. And uh, for now, that moment is far, far, far away. Uh, because I have a lot of goals and a lot of dreams that I want to do with music. And one of the main goals that I have is uh, making music for uh, films, indie films, short films. Um, that doesn't really matter to me. But making uh, music for movies or TV series or games, that, that would be amazing. Why? So that That is, I feel like um, a lot of neoclassical artists eventually get tasked Maybe they go into like the indie film world and the documentary world. And eventually some of them are hugely successful at doing major films. Um, and it still sounds like their independent neo neoclassical stuff sounds a lot like their film music. Like they're definitely related. Yes. Is there something about crafting music, like watching filmed stuff that's already done and then crafting music for it to make music for the event? Is there a reason you think that sounds like... I mean, it's all so it's money like, hey, that's great. Yeah. Um, but is there something exciting? What about the idea of film music? Music sounds exciting. Um, the, the idea uh, to make uh, a special song for a film or make a special arrangement for a movie or anything like that, uh, that that would be wonderful. Um, and also to be a little bit more ego i would love to hear my own music in a movie and go to the cinema and see it and be like yeah that's my music <laughs> but no no the, the most important thing for me is like um making music that fits with the whole with the whole uh, idea behind the movie and uh, uh, make it sound like it was uh well it is made for the movie but uh, like you made it for the movie and that it has always been uh, music for that movie. What is it like to collaborate with people? And do you, if you do collaborate with people musically, is it remote where you're sending, you're making music and someone else is making music and you're putting it together or one person makes music and you add or, you know, add to it? Or do you, have you had a chance to like get together with people in a room to do stuff? No, it's always uh, remote. Um, I, I met a lot of people on Twitter and online uh, and I did some collaborations with them. Uh, most of them, uh, I did some vocals uh, with, uh, or people did vocals for one of my uh, songs. I uh, worked with another uh, musician and made a more experimental song. Um, I, I Let me think, because in the beginning I did more uh, collaborations, but it's also kind of difficult because you're... Uh, uh, because it's remote you you and you have a time limit and you want to have the album done uh, it takes a lot of time sometimes and sometimes i i just don't have the time i would love to do it more because i think uh working together with more uh musicians is very important and 
Uh, I also love to let uh, people hear their music and their influence in my songs or uh, my music in their songs. And uh, yeah, I think that's also really important to help each other in, in this music world because people are, uh, there's a lot of talent and uh, I don't think a lot of people know how much talent there is in the music world. Are you? I am overwhelmed seeing how much music there is available to me to stream. Um, it sounds like from one perspective, it's exciting. There's so many people making music today and that it's so easy for people to make music in their house or in their mm -hmm. town and then put it everywhere. But on the other hand, it's like so much stuff to sift through. So do you ever get frustrated with how much stuff there is out there? Or do you always look at it as like, I just think it's the greatest thing, the fact there's all this music? Um, no, the, the thing that I do most of the time is, uh, because sometimes I'm on Spotify and I'm just browsing some music and then you always get like, oh, you might also like this artist or you might, uh, want to listen to this radio from this artist. And I'm start listening to the radio of that artist and then discover more musicians and more, uh, similar music. And I go on and go on and go on down the rabbit hole with this whole music thing. And, um, at some point, I'd be like, you know what? I, I think I've discovered enough new music and I can listen to some of the artists uh, for the next couple of weeks. And then again, a couple of weeks later, I try to discover some new musicians or some new music or um, find out if they, uh, the musician were in other bands or did some other projects and stuff like that. So I'm always looking forward to discovering new musicians, but it's it there's a lot. There's a lot of music and some of the music I'd be like, yeah, I've I've heard this like ten thousand times already, and and it's it's fun, and I enjoy it. But yeah, no, not for me. Okay, it sounds like I, I think I'm probably in the zone where I go back to my comfort music more and the kinds of music I liked before. I just keep looking for that. It sounds like it's awesome. It sounds like you're kind of in music discovery mode. Yeah, I want you to do that for me now. So I have two questions okay. about. <laughs> okay, the first question is if somebody wants to listen to hipster pug and they've never listened to Hipster Pug before, what song or what EP or what album would you say, go listen to this first and see what you think? Uh, I always recommend Neo Noir, uh, the album from 2020. But um, if you're really new and you really want to hear what I make right now in the music uh, style that I'm doing right now, I really recommend the latest EP, the Novo Chapitre album or EP. Okay, and now much wider. So somebody's like, okay, before I listen to Hipster Pug or after listening to Hipster Pug, if this is neoclassical or ambient and I'm like, oh, I like this, mm -hmm. where do you tell them? Where would you be like, you should go listen to either these three works or these three artists right now? What would you tell people? Somebody's like, tell me about neoclassical and ambient. Go listen to what? Uh, <laughs> I, I can name a whole list of uh, artists. <laughs> No, we, we talked about it already, like news from um, Olaf Arnolds, Max Richter, Johan Johansson, um, Hauska. I, I'm not the biggest Hauska fan, but it's enjoyable. Um, and I also recommend the label that I'm part of. <laughs> uh, it's called Monochrome Motive. It's a small label with, I think, around seven artists. Uh, you can find it on uh, Bandcamp. And there's a lot of talent there too. Also neoclassical, ambient, uh, and like I said, very talented too. Do you have a rather than saying what are your what are your favorite albums? Do you have one album if somebody said you know you're going to get left on a desert island somewhere and you're only going to have one album to listen to, or you have three hours, you can listen to anything you want, but one thing, that's it. Is there a certain thing you found yourself you go back to the most, either for nostalgia or because you just find something new in it every time? Do you have a favorite one? Um, That's a very difficult question because it changes with time. Um yeah, it, it's really difficult because right now <laughs> this is going to sound stupid because we have been talking about uh, neoclassical the whole time. But the album from Phoebe Bridgers, <laughs> even though it's modern pop and indie, uh, I, I really enjoy the album Punisher from her. It's it's just uh, amazing. And 
I don't know why I like it. It's it's the sound, it's the vocals, it's the the way she makes the music. Um, but that's an album I've been listening uh, a lot lately. Uh, but if you ask me next week, I'll probably have another album or something. <laughs> and um, I also, uh, if there's one song that I'm always uh, go back to, it's uh, um, Infra Five from. Uh, Max Richter, it's from the Infra album. Like I said before, you really need to listen to the full album, but Infra 5 is just a masterpiece of music. Um, also, Johan Jonsson, uh, Orphe, what is uh, also a fantastic album, especially the first song is six minutes. It's the same thing over and over and over again, but it's super wonderful. It's I, I cannot explain how, how beautiful it is. Uh, I, you really need to listen to it. Um, and also, um, what was the other song? Uh, I, I think it's called Particles. It's from the Island Songs album from Oliver Arnold. I also really recommend that album because it's uh, even though uh, even better. On YouTube, there's like a movie uh, about the Iceland songs with all the music played and uh, with uh, Olaf Arnold behind the piano and all the artists that works uh, with him. You really need to see that. That's that's an experience. <laughs> yeah. That's really something you really need to watch this weekend when you're on YouTube. 